قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني إن شاء الله تعالى brothers and sisters will be as short as sweet as we were for the Eid Khutbah insha'Allah because what I have to say doesn't take a lot and it doesn't need a lot insha'Allah we will discuss something that is of unique importance to this entire weekend as well as it is of some unique importance to Muslims here in the West as well as all over the globe and it is a problem that we all face and a crime that we all are guilty of at some point now there are some attempts throughout the world and these attempts are not anything new these attempts have been tried again and again they do get worse with time but as they say there's nothing new under the sun but along with these attempts, there is the Muslim response. These attempts are the attempts to disparage the beautiful character, life example of the most beloved human being of us to ever walk the face of the earth, as well as the most beautiful human being Allah ever created, the best of us. And this is our beloved Prophet Sallallahu And all of you know the attempts that I'm speaking of. They've been tried over and over again, a few years ago, a couple years ago, now a couple weeks ago. It's just repetitive attempts to disparage the beautiful character of the Prophet Sallallahu Now I'm going to deal with this in a couple of ways. I'm going to first deal with it on what we should be doing and then deal with it on how we should be dealing with this. Allah, to the best of our ability because this is an issue it is an issue that Muslims in the West are facing and we are suffering repercussion and backlash because of some of the things that are being said and because of some of the things that are being done etc you know a few years ago after the Danish cartoons came out about our beloved Prophet وسلم, which weren't as bad as actually the Swedish cartoons but nevertheless I gave a lecture in Ireland to defend the character of the Prophet and I gave a lecture talking about he wasn't this, he wasn't that, he wasn't this, he wasn't that. And a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, you spent a lot of time telling us who Muhammad وسلم, was not. But you did not tell us who he was. And I realized how deep of a mistake I had made because in attempting to defend the character of the Prophet وسلم, I broke my own rule, which is to never tell someone what Islam is not about. So I apologized to her and she asked me a simple question. Who was Muhammad, peace be upon him? That's it. That's all she wanted to know. Who was Muhammad, peace be upon him? Simple question, but not a simple answer. Simple question, but not a simple answer. Because she didn't want to know entitlements. She didn't want to know he was... He was a mercy to all of creation. She didn't want to know he was that he was the seal of prophethood. She didn't want to know that he was uh, she didn't want to know any of these things. She wanted to know who was the man named Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Who was that man? She wanted to know this. And she was sincere. But I was left a little bit speechless. Not because I had never read the seerah of the Prophet والسلام, or a number of seerahs of the Prophet والسلام, or a number of the relevant hadith that describe the Prophet وسلم, how he was when he ate, when he drank, when he slept, how he was a father, as a husband, as a leader, as an emir, all of these things. It was because how am I going to define the life of the greatest human being to ever walk the face of the globe to this woman in this short amount of time that she's given me. Because she's asked me a question, she wants an answer. She doesn't have time for me to sit down and take her on a sirah course. She wants an answer. How do I define such a great man to this woman? 
So I told her a few things and she left. And then I really began to worry about uh, my inability to answer this question like this. I was worried about it. So on the flight back, I asked my own self the same question. Who is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to you? Because if I can't define him to myself without having to go through a six-month Sira course, then how can I truly convey that to anyone else? And that's what I'm going to give you today, insha'Allah ta'ala. Just like the last khutbah I gave in this masjid, I gave you a gift, I'm going to give you another one today. Because in answering that question for myself, not only did I find out a way to convey the message of the greatest human being that ever walked the face of the earth to the rest of humanity in a very short and simple manner, and who he was, I ended up defining my own self. I ended up finding out who I was. I ended up realizing who I am, my own identity in that process. And I think that's one of the greatest ni'mas that Allah has given me after leading me to Islam, was to define myself, know who I am. And that definition drives me when I get up in the morning. That definition drives me when things get tough. That definition put me here today, 14 hours on the road to be here, was this definition, is the reason why I do what I do. It is who I am and what makes me who I am. We're going to, insha'Allah ta'ala, go through the life of the Prophet No, we're not going through a sirah course. We're going to, insha'Allah ta'ala, lay out a few things. I'm going to lay out a few things for you that's going to make this point crystal clear. There will be absolutely no shubahat about this issue when you leave here today. Bi'idhni Allah ta'ala. And I'm only going to give you four stories. Four. Four stories. But these stories are so beautiful that they leave no doubt. And they define the entirety of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Just these four stories, I can define the entire life of the Prophet ﷺ. Actually, the first one, I can define everything. But I'll be thorough, inshaAllah. And what we're going to do is we're going to connect the dots. And I'm sure many of you have been here in America for a while. You've heard that terminology before. Let's connect the dots. Let's put some things together in an appropriate manner. And that comes from children's puzzles, actually. Children have puzzles called connect the dots. That is a picture that is dots that are numbered. And if you follow the numbers, it will draw a picture. Now, what happens is if you don't connect those dots properly on that children's puzzle, you misrepresent the image. You misrepresent the image that is portrayed by the artist who drew the puzzle. If you don't connect the dots properly, and this is a lot of what happens with the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, even by us as Muslims. Or, what most of us do is we don't connect any of the dots at all. We just leave the puzzle laying there as it is. And therefore, it never truly represents its full potential. It never truly gets conveyed from the person who made the picture to you what it truly is and what it truly represents. And this is our biggest mistake. So today, inshaAllah ta'ala, we'll connect a few dots. And with four dots, you can't paint a very elaborate puzzle in black and white. But with the life of the Prophet, والسلام, I don't need more than four. Let's begin with the first one. And all of these, I don't need to tell you where they came from, the book title, the reference number, well-known stories. You've known all of these for all of your life, most of you. The first one is when the Prophet, والسلام, was 40 years old. And he was meditating in the Ghar al-Hira, the cave of Hira. In Mecca, and this is him telling his own story that when he was in the cave meditating, as was his norm, he was alone. All of a sudden, a figure appeared to him, and I'm paraphrasing the stories for the time's sake. He said, A figure appeared unto him in this cave. All of a sudden, he was not alone, and the person who came in the cave with him made the cave become bright. And that person looked at him and only had one word for him one word for him. Iqara. Read, recite. The Prophet ﷺ replied to the, to the person, I don't know how. I don't know how to read. I don't know what you want me to recite. The figure squeezed him and said, Iqara, read. Again, I don't, don't know how. Third time, the figure squeezed him and said, Iqara, Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaqa. Read in the name of your Lord who created. Created man from a congealed drop of blood. Read in your Lord is most bounteous. Taught that to man by the use of the pen that which he did not know. Beautiful words that would become the initial verses 
of Allah's last revelation to humanity, the most weighty statements to ever be sent to mankind in the glorious Quran. Now, this figure before him introduces himself and says, I am Jibreel, Gabriel, the messenger from Allah to the messengers of Allah. This is my job. Then he introduced Muhammad وسلم, to his Rabb. He said, your Lord is Allah who created you to worship him with Tawheed. Then Muhammad وسلم, was introduced to himself. Because Jibreel said, and you, O Muhammad, have been chosen by Allah your Lord to be his last and final messenger to humanity. And with those few simple words, the same way that Jibreel came, he left. Gone. Leaving the Prophet وسلم, with a weight on his shoulders that was so heavy he could feel it. A weight that Allah Azzawajal says in Surah Al Hashr, had we revealed this Quran into one of the mountains, you would have seen it humble itself out of khashya for Allah. The mountain would have just crumbled into pieces. This weight is now sitting on the shoulders of Muhammad وسلم, and he feels it. So, what does he do? He leaves the cave and he goes home to his wife Khadija, radiallahu anha, his comfort and his consort in this life. But on the way home, Jibreel alayhi salam appears one more time. But this time he's standing across the sky with one foot on each horizon. And he says to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, I am Gabriel and you are indeed the messenger of Allah. Don't have any doubt about that. This is not a dream, this is not a vision. You have not starved yourself into hallucinations. This is real. So when he got home to his wife Khadija radiallahu anha, he told her what happened. And said, you know, what, what, what happened to me? Have I gone crazy? Khadija radiallahu anha responded to him with the beautiful words that you are not someone whom Allah would disgrace with madness. You take care of the poor. You help the needy. You don't pass anyone without a smile. You stand up for justice. You are not someone whom Allah would disgrace with madness. So not only did she believe in him, she comforted him. Became the first believer in Islam. Then Khadija radiallahu anha had a relative that she knew might have a little bit more information about this incident than she had. She had a relative named Waraqa bin Nawfal radiallahu an, who had studied the Torah and the Injil as it was at that time. As it was at that time, he had read the Torah and the Injil. He knew about the former revelations from Allah. So she went to her relative and told him what happened to her husband. And Waraqa said, by Allah, your husband has been visited by the same angel that visited Musa. The same angel that visited Isa. This is indeed Jibreel and he does not come to anyone but the messengers of Allah. Your husband has been chosen to be a last and final messenger and I have read about him in these books. Now, Waraqa met the Prophet وسلم, a little while later. Maybe a few days, who knows how long passed, difference of opinion. He met the Prophet a short time later and he gave him some ominous news. He had become very old at that time and was blind and weak. But he told the Prophet وسلم, not only does he believe in him, but he said, I wish I was a young man. I wish I was a young man so that I could stand beside you to support you when your people throw you out. Now you have to understand the Asabiyya, the tribalism of the Jahili Arabs. And I'm sure some of you can feel it today because it's almost reverted back to some of that. That the Arabs in the time of Jahiliyyah would support family members even in blatant wrongdoing. Even if I know my relative is wrong, I will support him anyway. Because he is my relative. It's just the way it worked. So the Prophet ﷺ couldn't grasp for this one simple word he's asking them for. He's asking them for one simple word, Ahad. They will throw me out? Waraqa said, have no doubt about this fact. No one came with what you are coming with, except that their own people were the first to throw them out. So he gave him some very ominous news. Now, after this initial revelation, no more revelations came. Jibreel didn't come visit the Prophet ﷺ anymore. Nothing happened. 
he was just left to contemplate this task at hand. And he said it came to a point to where it bothered him. So the Prophet ﷺ left the city of Mecca and went to walk out in, in the Badia, in, in, in the desert, where there was nothing. And he said, while I was walking, Jibreel ﷺ appeared again, suddenly, standing across the sky and said to me, I am Gabriel, you are indeed the messenger of Allah. Don't ever doubt that. And the Prophet ﷺ said it frightened him. So he ran home to his wife Khadija radiallahu anha and he told her, Dhamiluni, cover me up. So she wrapped him in a, in a thick blanket. And in that position of being wrapped up in this blanket, Allah revealed the next verses. And subhanAllah, what weighty verses they are. Allah says to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this condition of being under this blanket, Ya ayyuhal mudathir, hum fa'andir. Oh, you who is wrapped up in this mantle, get up, boom, get up, and go warn the people. And magnify your Lord and purify your garments and stay away from the idols. Subhanallah. The Prophet ﷺ only had the first few verses of Surah Al-Iqra. He only knew who Jabril was. He knew who Allah was. He knew who he was. But Allah is telling him, no, 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 no. There is no more time for laying around. Boom, get up. فَأَنْذِرْ And go warn the people. This is why I have sent you. This is why you're here. This is why I've given you the Qur'an. This is why I have chosen you above all of humanity. Is so that you can know, now go and warn humanity about me. They have forgotten about me. فَأَنْذِرْ So go warn them. The Prophet ﷺ, without hesitation, threw the blanket off and got busy doing his job. Which was to warn mankind about Allah. And to warn mankind about a day in which they will meet Allah. And he did that tirelessly for the rest of his life. Qum fa'andir is what kept the Prophet ﷺ up at night. Qum fa'andir is what made him struggle so much throughout the day. Qum fa'andir was what made him worry about his position in front of his Rabb because he knew that he had a weighty task on his hands that must be discharged and that he would be questioned about it on the day he stood before Allah. Qum Fa'andir defined him for the rest of his life. And if you think any differently, just go pick up any seerah book and read it. Qum Fa'andir defined him from this point on because everything he did after this point was revolving around this verse. Am I doing my job in delegating this responsibility in front of Allah? So if I wanted to stand here today and say, summarize the Prophet for me Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in one phrase, I'll tell you, Qum Fa'andir summarizes him. This is who he was. He was a man who cared about people, who was concerned about people's souls, where their soul would rest in the next life. This was his concern. He didn't care about their position in this life. His care was about their soul and where it would be in the next life. That's all he cared about. And he was concerned about every single human soul and where it stood with their Lord. Qum Fa'andir defined the greatest man that would ever walk the face of this earth. It was his sunnah. For those who say we follow the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, well if you're not starting with Qum Fa'andir, you've left the entire sunnah out already. Because the sunnah is not about how high you pick up your thob or how long you let your beard grow or how many times you use miswak. This is not the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. These are certain attributes that defined him physically. His sunnah was that he carried the message of tawheed to the world. This was his sunnah. And this is the forgotten sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The most forgotten and the most important. Now, if I just stopped right here, said that's it, Qum Fa'andir defined him. If you believe I'm wrong, prove me wrong. I have done my job and nobody will come up to me to prove me wrong. You can't, it's not there. But I want to be thorough so I'm going to give you a couple more inshallah ta'ala in the next five minutes. And if I wanted to, if I wanted to be particularly thorough, I could keep you here all day. We could, we could, Continue Juma on way past its time length. I could end Juma, start after Asr, 
stay until Maghrib, finish again after Maghrib, stay after Isha, continue all night. Qiyam al layl would do another lecture. And it would just continue on and on and on, proving this very point of Qumf Andir. But I think you already are getting the picture. But we'll be a little bit thorough. Let's go to the story of Ta'if, and I'm just going to breeze over it because I got a couple more. The story of Ta'if, the Prophet ﷺ lost his wife Khadija, his comfort. Lost his uncle Abu Talib, his protection. The wolves of Quraysh are gathering around him. He takes Zayd, his adopted son, and marches to the city of Ta'if. They didn't jump on a bus or a, or, or a taxi or any coach or anything like that. No, they walked all the way to Ta'if and spent three days, according to the most valid opinion, knocking on the doors of Ta'if. Doing what? Qum fa'anzir. Doing Qum fa'anzir. And the only thing they were asking people to do was accept this message of Islam. Accept the message of Tawheed and save your soul in this life and in the next. Every single door was slammed in their face. Every single door slammed in their face. Until they were able to sit down with the notables of Ta'if. And they told them the message of Islam and asked them either accept Islam or accept me as a protector. Protect me from my own people. The ones that throw him out. Just like Waraka told him they would do. The nobles of Ta'if not only did not accept the message of Islam, they did not accept to protect the Prophet wasallam, but they laughed in his face. They laughed in his face. And this day, according to Aisha radiallahu anha, is the worst day of the greatest human being's life that ever walked the face of this earth. You think you've had a bad day? Let me guarantee you not had a bad day. This was the bad, the worst day of the best human being to ever walk the face of this earth. The leaders of Ta'if mocked, laughed at him. And said, could not Allah found someone better than you? Could not have Allah found someone better than you? Could not have Allah chosen one of our chiefs? Or one of the chiefs of the two towns, meaning Taif and Mecca? Couldn't have Allah found someone better than you? Who are you? We don't know you. And if you are a true prophet, then we're not very good, so you're too good to be sitting with us. And if you're a liar, which is what we think, then we're too good to be sitting with you. Either way, it's time to go. His only request was that they don't announce the rejection of him. Not only did they not accept that either, but they called all the men to line up, and then the children line up after the men, and then the women line up after the children, and literally stone him out of town, beating him with rocks and whatever they could get their hands on to throw. His adopted son Zayd trying to protect him, getting beaded or bladdered and bloody in the process until both of them left the city with blood dripping down their beautiful bodies and into the feet and the, filling the shoes of our beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let me tell you, you haven't had a bad day yet. In this condition, Jibreel Alayhi Salam appeared because after this they went outside of the city and rested. And Jibreel alayhi salam appeared. There are some other stories about the dua and a slave coming and think these are a bit weak, so I'm going to leave them out for the khutbah. Jibreel alayhi salam appeared. And beside him was the angel that is in charge of all the mountains of the earth. Because Allah had just seen what had happened and he was very, very angered by the treatment of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he sent Jibreel alayhi salam with the angel of the mountains. And the angel of the mountains was infuriated. And Jibreel greeted the Prophet Salamu alayka ya Rasulullah. With me is the angel of the mountains. Allah has seen what these people have done to you. And the angel of the mountains only had one request. O Messenger of Allah, just give me the permission. Just say the word and I will take the mountains that surround these cities and I will push them together and I will destroy everyone for what they have done to you. Allah had already made it halal, brothers and sisters. Or these angels wouldn't be here. Allah had already made it halal for the messenger to take his revenge. There was such awful treatment. Take your revenge. Now if it had been any of us. <laughs> if it had been any of us. Those cities would not exist on the face of the earth today. And not even a mention of them would be known. Because we will chase someone for miles if they cut us off in traffic. Just to start a fight with them. So these people would have been done. Long done. We would have gotten rid of all of our enemies in one day. But you have to understand, for someone who was rahmatul lil alameen, for someone who knew his job was kum fa'anzir, no, 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 no. This does not fit 
my purpose. This doesn't fit my purpose. I'm not here to destroy lives. I'm here to bring them to Tawheed. So if one person from these people's progeny comes out of them and says, La ilaha illallah, it's worth what I went through today. My personal suffering is not greater than the message that I have been sent with. Subhanallah. This is who Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is. Forget about this innocent of the Muslims video. Forget about these cartoons and these images they portray. This is the man Muhammad that they're talking about. So let them say what they want to say. The truth is glaring them right in the face. Right in the face. And many of you may not know, but for our subcontinent community, I'll give you a small side note. You owe a lot of gratitude to the day of Ta'if. Because there was a young man named Muhammad ibn Qasim that took Islam to Southeast Asia when he was 17 years old, by the way. And his last adage to his name was Athaqafi. Athaqafi meaning he hailed from the city of Ta'if. He came from these same people who rejected the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ had the right to destroy, but he did not. This is what you call Qul hadihi sabili adu ala ala basira. Say, this is my way I call to Allah with not with basira, with vision. This is vision at play. This is a man who understood Qum fa'andir was his duty. Two more and we're done, very quickly. Let's fast forward a little bit to the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So you don't leave here today with any doubt about this matter. The last year of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, one year after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah had been signed, allowing the Muslims to make pilgrimage, Hajj, the Prophet ﷺ stood on his minbar and he called for all of the Muslims to prepare themselves to make the Hajj to the house of Allah Azza wa Jal in Mecca. And he himself led this Hajj and he gathered between 120 to 140,000 companions. Subhanallah. This is Qum Fa'andir at work. Now, this incident that I'm going to tell you now is the most authentic narration that comes from the Prophet ﷺ, the most authentic hadith that exists. And it happened two days. No, it actually happened on a day just like this. Because it happened after Yawm al Arafah. And Umar radiallahu an narrates the longest version of it in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala. Where Umar says, after Yawm al Arafah, where Allah forgives the sins of his slaves, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa called all of us together, told us to come close to him. And he himself was standing on Jabr Rahmah. The mountain of mercy, which for those of you who have made Hajj know that it's not much of a mountain other than just a bunch of big rocks. And he looked at all of his companions and he delivered to them what would become known as the farewell sermon. The most authentic hadith we have. The farewell sermon. The last and final statement to the Prophet ﷺ to this ummah. Now what is the farewell sermon? It's what Islam is all about. It is what Islam is about. And the Prophet ﷺ started it by saying how important it was. Pay close attention to my words, for I do not know whether I will be with you again on this day, at this place, after this year. Letting the Muslims know, listen, this might be the last time I speak to all of you. Pay attention to my words. Then he told them the farewell sermon, which we don't have the time for. But every few sentences he would stop and he would question the people in front of him. And what did he ask them? He said to them, one day you will be questioned about me. What are you going to say? And all of the companions said the same thing. We will bear witness that you indeed conveyed the message of Allah to us. You did kum fa'andir. And you gave us the most sincere advice. They said, we will bear witness that you did your job. And you gave us the most sincere advice. Then he would say a few things, ask the same question. But the biggest part is what he said at the end. The end of the farewell sermon is something I think we have read so many times we've forgotten what it means. We have forgotten how important it is. We have forgotten what happened on this day. At the end of the farewell sermon, the Prophet ﷺ said, Those who are here today, convey this message to those that are not here. Subhanallah. I don't think we understand what just happened on that day. Those who are here today, convey this message to those that are not here. For truly, it may be that the one who is conveyed the message to may understand it better than the one who is conveying it to him. 
You know what just happened, brothers and sisters? Something paramount just happened. Something that had never happened before in history. The Prophet ﷺ held the status of a prophet and messenger for 23 years. And that job of conveying the message of Islam to the world, that job of kum fa'andir was never delegated to anyone except prophets and messengers. Ever. Allah says this in Surah Al-Bayina. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا الْيَعْبُدُوا لَهَا مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ دِينَ هُنَفَا وَيُقِّمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُوا الزَّكَاءَ وَذَلِقُ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمَةِ They weren't commanded anything the other generations before us but to worship Allah, establish a salah, pay zakah. That was for them the right religion. Wait till the next messenger comes. But the Prophet ﷺ was Khatim al nabiyin He was the seal of all prophets. No more messenger is going to come. But he himself, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, knew that that message of tawheed had to continue to go forward. There, there would come generations after him who would need to hear this message. There would be other people in the world who would need to hear this message when he was gone. So he took that delegated job that was only given to prophets and messengers and he handed it to the greatest ummah that would ever walk the face of the earth. Why do you think we are kuntum khayran ummatan ukhrijat linnas? We didn't get that because Allah rolled some dice and decided to make this ummah the greatest nation. Astaghfirullah. Allah says, kuntum khayran ummatan ukhrijat linnas. Ta'amaroon bil marufi wa tanhan al alin munkar wa tu'minun billah. Why? Because you do the job of commanding to good, forbidding evil, and why you believe in Allah. You do the job of a prophet and a messenger in his absence. That's why you are the greatest nation. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, even though you are the last nation on the day of judgment, you'll be first. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said that you will be a witness over every other nation, just like I'll be a witness. Do we understand that our izza is based upon this statement? That the greatest Izzah that has ever been conferred upon any nation was conferred on us that day. Subhanallah. This is what makes us so great that when Nuh alayhi salam, the first messenger, when Nuh alayhi salam, the first prophet, excuse me, when Nuh alayhi salam is questioned by Allah, he will ask him, Nuh, did you convey your message to your people? Nuh alayhi salam will say, yes, I did. You know I did. Allah will say, do you have a witness? No, ask, actually first, He will ask Nuh's people, did any messenger come to you? They will say, no. No messenger came to us. Nobody came to us telling us anything about you. So Allah will ask Nuh, do you have a witness? Do you have a witness that will prove you did your job? Nuh alayhi salam's response will be, go to Muhammad and his followers. They bear witness of me. And we will bear witness. Why? Because it's right there in our book. No, yes, he did his job, Ya Allah. We know he did his job. The same will be for Musa. The same will be for Isa. The same will be for Zakaria. We will give that witness. This is the beautiful izzah that Allah has guaranteed this ummah. And we are the only ummah that our Prophet will be given the shifa on the day of judgment. Subhanallah. We have to realize who we are. Our position is great, but the reason it is great is because the task at hand is great. Now let me finish. When the Prophet ﷺ said, pass this on to those that are not here, do you know what he did? Do you know what he did after making that statement? He raised his fingers to the heavens and he said, Oh Allah, bear witness. Oh Allah, bear witness. Oh Allah, bear witness. I have conveyed your message. He swore to us and said, Ya Allah, I did my job. Kum fa'andir, you gave it to me 23 years ago and today I completed it. I did my job and I handed it to the greatest nation that would ever walk the face of the earth. And Allah Azza wa Jalla responded to this statement of saying, I did my job by saying, al akmaltu lakum deenukum. This day I have perfected your religion. Subhanallah and completed my ni'mah upon you and have chosen for you Islam as your deen. This day, upon this statement of the Prophet wasallam, Allah said, my religion to humanity is done. It is completed, it is perfected, and it is in the hands of the greatest nation. That's it. What happened to us? What happened to that nation? What happened to that nation who carried the banner of Tawheed all across the world? It made us so great that not a dare person would ever think to open their mouths of the things they say today about our beloved Prophet ﷺ. They wouldn't even contemplate it. You have to understand that even if they thought it, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say it. 
because they knew that the izza and the honor of the Muslims was unchallengeable because it was given to them by Allah. You can say what you want and you can think what you want about them, but the honor that Allah gave them is theirs. And that was our position for a very long time until we forgot who we were. We forgot our own selves as Allah says, those who forget their own, those who forget about Allah, we make them forget their own selves. We forgot who we were a long time ago. We need to remember again. We need to remember again. And if you can't remember, you need to at least tell these little children who they are. That they are the greatest nation to ever be walking the face of this earth. But it comes on a condition that they live up to the status of the Messenger وسلم, who gave it to them by Allah Azza wa Jalla's will. أقول قبل هذا واستغفر لي ولكم فاستغفره إنه هو الغفر الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله عما بعد. We need to remember who we are. Seriously, we need. To give up this attitude of despondency, this attitude of degradation, this attitude of, 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 I'm not trying to use derogatory words which I can't use, but we need to wake up to our reality. That Allah Azza wa Jal created you and made you Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Allah Azza wa Jal conferred a favor upon you and you are in a state of indebtedness to Allah forever. You will never get out of it. The fact that Allah Azawajal woke you up, and I'm going to give you a very beautiful reminder at the end to think about today. The fact that Allah woke you up this morning as a Muslim, made you indebted as a slave with a debt that you can never repay, ever. No one can ever repay it. And you need to remember that. That Allah has conferred a favor upon you and you are in debt. And that means you have some paying back to do. Last story. This one's very short. The last day of the life of the Prophet والسلام, The day of Ta'if was the worst day of his life. This day is the worst day of my life. And I wasn't there. I wasn't there. But if it's not the worst day that you have ever known, then you need to check your own iman. You need to check your own iman if this day is not the worst day that you've ever known. The Prophet والسلام, was sick and he was laying his head on the chest of the woman whom he loved the most in this life, Aisha radiallahu anha. The only person he loved more was not her father, was not Abu Bakr, was Abuha. This is how he stated it. That the only person he loved more than Aisha was Abuha, her father. Making sure that he still reminds you that it's not Abu Bakr I love, it's her father that I love. Her father. He had his head on her chest. And he was looking at a miswak stick. And she asked him, do you want it? He said, yes. He nodded. So she softened it with her own saliva. Radiallahu anha. And he brushed his teeth. And then something happened that Aisha wasn't privy to at that moment. But she became aware of what was happening in a, a moment later. The angel of death walked into the room. Now, when the angel of death walks in to any one of us, wherever we may be, the only conversation that will take place between us and the angel of death is soul come out. That's it. Soul come out. That's it. And the soul will respond. Either easily, like water coming from a jug, or heavily, like thorns being torn from a ball of wool. It's the only way it's going to happen. There's no other way about it. But for the prophets and messengers, والسلام, Allah has a different position with them. Even the angel of death had to seek permission to take their blessed, beautiful souls. And before the prophets were taken into death, before the angel of death took their souls, he always showed every one of them their place in Jannah. The Prophet والسلام, said that before every prophet and messenger dies, he shown his place in Jannah. So Aisha radiallahu anha said she saw the Prophet begin to look at the ceiling. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He started to look up and smile. He was being shown his place in Jannah. And we can only 
the mind will never do any justice to, to that image. It's just not possible. It's not possible. And he was looking at the final resting place for him for the rest of eternity. And the angel of death presented him with an option. You can either recover from this illness by the will of Allah, continue to live on for some more time with your ummah, or you can go here. You can go here. It's your choice. I can't take your soul without your permission. Subhanallah. What, I mean, what, what, what kind of choice is this to really make? Aisha radiallahu anha said she saw the Prophet look up and began to smile. And after saying, As-salah, 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 reminding this ummah, don't forget about your connection with your Lord. She heard him start to say, Allahumma rafiq al-ala, Allahumma rafiq al-ala, O oh Allah, the companion on Most High. And Aisha radiallahu anha said, at that moment I knew the angel of death was here and that he wasn't choosing to stay with us. She said, I knew the angel of death was here and our messenger was not choosing to stay with us anymore. And he breathed his last breath on that day. And the angel of death took the purest soul that Allah ever created and placed it in the highest ranks that Jannah will ever know. Will ever know. And this became the saddest day for every one of the companions. And if it is not the saddest day to every Muslim, you need to check your Iman. Because that's the day we lost everything that we had. We lost the most beautiful gift that Allah ever gave creation was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even Umar, which Umar was such a fierce man, such a firm believer in Allah, that the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, if there were any Prophet after me, it would be Umar. And Shaitan was so afraid of Umar that he would not not even dare confront him face to face. If Umar took one street and Shaitan was on the same street, he would divert and go down another path. But Omar lost it on that day and said, If anyone says Muhammad is dead, I'll kill you myself. Until Abu Bakr consoled him and reminded him that Allah said, Muhammad is nothing but a messenger. The messengers passed away before him. But there was a woman on that day, and this is, we, this is the end, how we end the story. There was a woman on that day, her name was Umm Ayman. Radi Allahu anha wa ardaha. If you don't know who Umm Ayman is, you need to go way back in the seerah. Way, way, way back. Um Ayman was the woman whom Amina, the mother of the Prophet, entrusted him to. Was the helper of Amina. Was the woman who care took for the Prophet ﷺ after the death of his mother, like his mother for the rest of his life. So for someone who says that the Prophet ﷺ does not show us how to be a good son to his mother, they must have never looked at the relationship between the Prophet ﷺ and Um Ayman because he treated her as his mother. He treated her the way that a mother should be treated. And she lived to see him grow up. She lived to see him become an adult. She lived to see him enter prophethood. She lived to see him rejected. She lived to see him beaten. She lived to see him exiled. She lived to see the hijrah. She lived to see the battles, the conquest, the conquering of Mecca. And she lived to see his blessed death. And it was the most blessed death. But she began to cry profusely on this day. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? And Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah, they tried to console her and said, Yeah, Um Ayman, why are you crying? What the Prophet والسلام, is given in death is better than what Allah gave him in life. He suffered so much for us. He went through so much. He's better now. He's better. Um Ayman said, I'm not crying because of his death, meaning that I'm not concerned about him. I know it's better for him right now. And if you didn't hear anything else I said, you got to hear this. She said, I am crying because the wahi from Allah has stopped. She said, I'm crying because the revelation from Allah will not come anymore. She said, I'm crying because my Rabb will not speak to me again. Allah will never speak to us ever again. This is why I'm crying. And that was the true sadness of that day. Was that with the death of Khattam and Nabi'een, Allah will never speak to his creation again. No more revelations will ever come. No new information from Allah will ever come to you until the day you stand before Allah and then it'll be way too late. Why? Because Allah already said everything He needed to say. Allah has already said everything He needed to say. But you know something, Abu Bakr and Umar understood that statement much better than we understand it. They understood that yes, maybe Allah has stopped speaking to the creation, but that doesn't mean the creation has to stop hearing from Allah. They knew that the only way creation would ever hear from Allah again 
was if they did the job that was left to them a few months ago. If they did the job that the Prophet ﷺ left to them on his farewell sermon, the word of Allah continues. And they did their job flawlessly. And we have to say, you have to say, Alhamdulillah, they did not do what we do. Because if they had done what we do, Wallahu alam, if any of us would be Muslim. Allah knows if any of us would be Muslim if they did what we do. They did their job and they did it flawlessly. You are the living results of the fact that they did their job. And you are the results of the fact that Muslims throughout history have continued to do that job or you would not be here. What about the next generation? Who's going to tell them about Islam? The news, the media, that's who's telling about Islam right now and people are still coming to Islam. Why? Because Allah is guiding whomever He wishes, not because of what we're doing. Trust me. But we have a job to do. And we have an obligation at hand. Hum fa'andir, yes, it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, but it was left for us. And Allah commanded us, Udu'u ila sabir rabika bil hikmati wa ma'uzati al hasana. And Allah commanded His Prophet to say, Qul hadihi sabili adu ila Allah ala basira, ana wa mana tabi'ani. Me and those who follow me, we call to Allah upon sure guidance. This is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, was that he cared about people's souls and he cared about discharging his duty before Allah. He cared about telling people about Islam. He didn't care what position of life they had right now. He didn't care if they were his worst enemy yesterday. If they want to hear the message of Islam, they were his closest companion today. That's just the way it was. The message came before the man. The message always came before the man. This is the legacy of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So forget about the cartoons. Forget about all of these things. I leave you with this one last thing about these stories. Because we can go through and say, yes, look at how the companions dealt with Qab ibn al-Ashraf and this. And we can go on and on and on about that. They had power in that day. We have no power in the world anymore. And for anyone who thinks that the Ummah has power today, you haven't been very far. The daughter of the Prophet والسلام, was walking by the Quraysh one day and they were calling her father the insulted one. The insulted one, the one who is an insult to you, all of us. And she began to cry. And she went home to her father وسلم, and she was crying and her father said, My daughter, what is wrong with you? She said, Father, you are the messenger of Allah and they're calling you the insulted one. He smiled. وسلم, he smiled and he said, My daughter, they are calling me the insulted one while Allah has named me Muhammad, the eternally praised one. So they must be talking about someone else. Do you see the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ? He knew that the person that they were talking about was not him. He knew that he was named Muhammad ﷺ. He knew that Allah had verified وَإِنَّكَ لَعَالَ خُلْقٍ عَظِيمٍ and you are upon most noble character. So when they make these cartoons, I don't know why we get so angry. Because the person they're depicting is not the man Muhammad wasallam I've ever known. They're not the man Muhammad ibn Abdullah that I've read about. This movie that they have made is not about the messenger that I know. So they have made up some fictional character and named it Muhammad. They are insulting no one but their own selves. They are insulting no one but their own selves. Because the truth is very blatantly clearing, blaring them in the face. If we begin to live the example of Muhammad sallallahu in our lives, his legacy can never die. His legacy can never die because it lives on with us. We are a representative of who he was. But we have to live that. We have to breathe that. We have to show that in our life, inshaAllah ta'ala. So none of you should doubt who Muhammad sallallahu was today. He was kum fa'andir. A man who is concerned about people's soul, and you should be concerned about it too. And you should come and learn how to give that properly. Because it is a specialized field that is only for people who really love Allah and His Messenger. It takes a sincere heart and a sincere mind and a stout, astute soul to do this noble job. 
but that was what you were put here for. That's why Allah gave you Islam so that you could give it to someone else, insha'Allah ta'ala. Rabbana atina fa dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhab an-nar. Allahumma ghfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabit aqdamana wa ansurna ala qawmi al-kafirin. Allahumma innana as'aluka jannat wa firdaus al-ala ya rabb al-alamin wa a'udhu bika min al-nar wa a'udhu bika min al-nar wa a'udhu bika min al-nar. Subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursalin wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa aqim as-salam.